Well, thank you, Miriam, and everyone at Athlete Soul for hosting the Feed the Soul Virtual Summit. I always look forward to presenting mindfulness-based performance and health optimization. As Miriam mentioned, I'm an assistant clinical professor here at Auburn University, and I teach a series of 16-week courses, facilitate invited seminars, workshops, and also live virtual instruction, and all of these platforms are centered around the primary platform of mindfulness-based performance and health optimization. So the platform itself consists of an integrative approach to optimal performance, health, and well-being. And today's session is going to be a condensed version in order to highlight some of the key concepts. So let's go ahead and take a moment to jump right into mindfulness and push back from our table, desk, wherever we're seated. We're coming from a lot of different areas around the world. And we just wanna bring everyone's attention to a common space as we kick off the summit this morning. So as you push back, find a nice comfortable position and try to ensure that you have good posture, sitting with what I call some dignity, making sure that your shoulders are directly over your hips, your knees are directly over your ankles and your feet are flat on the floor. And just allow your eyes to fall softly on the floor in front of you, or you can close them, whichever is more comfortable for you. And slowly start to bring your awareness and your attention into the space that you're occupying, wherever you are right now. And start to notice the sounds. If your eyes are open, perhaps look around gently Get a good sense of what your environment feels like physically. And slowly draw that awareness into your own personal space, especially that of your body. Bringing your awareness to the physical vessel, just quickly scanning your body, seeing how you feel. You may notice some tightness or discomfort. You may feel relaxed and calm. Regardless of what you're noticing, just try to become the observer without any type of judgment or reactivity to it. And slowly bring your awareness down into your breath. Without changing the breath, just simply notice where the breath is. Whether it's long or short, fast or slow, shallow or deep. And as a group, let's go ahead and take one slow, deep inhale through our nose, expanding our diaphragm and filling up our lungs. And as we pause at the top, exhaling through our mouth slowly and in a controlled fashion, release any tension, discomfort, any stress or anxiety or worry you may have, anything on the to-do list. And simply notice how easily that next breath comes. And for the next minute, just sit quietly and try to become the observer of the breath. If you get distracted at all by a sound in your environment, a wandering thought, or something you forgot to do yesterday, just gently bring your focus back to the present moment. Go ahead and welcome some movement back into your body.
by gently wiggling your fingers and your toes, rolling your wrists and your ankles, and just allowing yourself to come back to our space. Thank you all. So it's very important to reference the brain in order to understand the multifaceted construct of mindfulness itself. Now, everyone is mindful to a certain degree because it's an inherent human capacity. And this is primarily due to our relatively large frontal lobe, specifically that prefrontal cortex that we all have. And this is what makes us humans. So if we were to take our hand and place it across our forehead and look down at our hand, it's a relatively large amount of neuronal real estate. And this is a good thing because the prefrontal cortex is responsible for decision-making, planning, problem solving, making judgments, reflecting on the past. And it's highly involved with the memory system as well. The interesting thing is that neuroscientists suggest the human brain generates an average of 80,000 thoughts a day. That's a lot of thoughts. And we know that most of these thoughts are habitual thoughts such as the thought of, I need to brush my teeth. So something as simple as brushing our teeth, there's always going to be a thought that precedes that behavior. In fact, we don't perform anything in our lives without first the thought. So in essence, thought precedes action. So really, if we're able to change our thinking, we then can change our performance, which ultimately changes our life. So let's take a moment here to define mindfulness. We know that it's an application-based practice. And the idea here is what we're trying to do with this practice is ultimately generate and sustain present moment awareness. So at the outset of the presentation, you were able to bring your attention into one common space. And of course, your mind starts to wander because of those 80,000 thoughts. And you gently bring it back into the present by way of utilizing our anchor. So the idea here is to generate and sustain present moment awareness in order to direct the energetic state. And the energetic state is comprised of physical, cognitive, and emotional. Now remember, this type of practice, while it is applied, it's very process-oriented as opposed to results or goal-oriented. And we have two different subcomponents of mindfulness. We have trait versus state. On the left-hand side of the screen, we're referring to trait here. And this is the idea that some individuals have a greater propensity to be more mindful than others. And really what this is referred to as is our general cognitive mode. Our general cognitive mode is broken down into mindfulness on one side and mind wandering on the other side. In that one minute session this morning, your mind probably wandered numerous times. And in that one minute session, you were able to find some sort of present moment awareness, maybe just a little bit. So with practice, this starts to change. And this is where the idea of state comes in. That's the here and now. This is where the practice of mindfulness is being applied. Practices such as structured and or informal meditation, mindful movement sequences, and even setting daily intentions. The important thing is to note here is that there's an interaction that exists. Research suggests that the physical architecture of our brain circuitry actually shifts with repeated experiences. So neuroscientists have observed that both functional and structural changes are associated with consistent application-based practice. The emphasis here is the consistency. Obviously, the more we practice something, the better we get at it. And it's, again, not a results-oriented approach. It's going to be more focused on that present moment awareness. So some of the benefits that we see associated with this repeated practice of mindfulness is reduced activity in the default mode network. And this is a region of the brain that's associated with mind wandering and or cognitive rumination. We also see a down regulation in the amygdala, which is the emotional center of the brain. And we see increased activity in the task positive network. This is that online attentional control region of the brain. So an important note to make here is that only one of the networks can be active at any given time. So the practice of mindfulness has been shown to activate the task positive network and thus deactivate 
the default mode network. And the more often this occurs, the more likely we will see these shifts in trait mindfulness as indicated by research on epigenetics. So as a human, you're a performer, and this is regardless of your respective performance domain. So as the title indicates of this session, mindfulness-based performance and health optimization, what I like to do is integrate mindfulness and performance. And this can be done by showcasing the relationship that exists among the two subfields. So on the screen here, you'll see on the y-axis, that vertical axis, level of performance from our lowest all the way up to our highest. And on the x-axis, the horizontal axis, we're gonna bring in the energetic state. So we're looking at a performance as a function of the energetic state. And more often than not, when you show individuals this particular relationship, they think it's a positive relationship that exists such that as our energetic state is increasing, as is our performance. But you have to be careful with this assumption. Other individuals report the opposite. They will say, as our energetic state increases too far, our performance actually drops. But both of these assumptions are simply incorrect. And if we're to combine them both together, really what we see here is an inverted U. And this area under the curve is referred to as our ideal performance state. And this is also known as flow or flow state. And this is akin to being in the moment, practicing that present moment awareness. So you'll see here on this figure that the area under the curve is somewhere in the middle. Balance starts to play a role here, not too high and not too low. And in reference to flow state, this is where we start to see that effortless focus and concentration. We know that the energetic state is running completely efficiently and effectively. We also know that our performance is at its highest and which is where we have the greatest amount of productivity. So in essence, this is when all cylinders are firing in synchronicity. Flow state also maximizes our ability to accurately respond to a situation. So we know that there's always gonna be a stimulus or multiple stimuli and there's always gonna be a response or multiple responses. If I'm to clap my hands, that is the stimulus, your auditory cortex will eventually respond and perhaps you'll have a startle reflex. But there's always a space. There's always a space between stimulus and response. And while individuals are in flow state, this space can become wider. And this is gonna allow for us to be able to process a greater amount of information accordingly. So this is definitely a good thing in respect to performance optimization. But again, to reiterate here, balance is so critical in regards to our energetic state. We don't wanna to be too high and we don't wanna to be too low. And this is where the practice of mindfulness comes into play. This is where the consistency of the practice also is of value. Now we talk a lot about balance and yes, while it is fundamental, it's an interesting construct to bring up because balance isn't something that you just happen to stumble upon or go to your neighborhood grocer and pick up six or seven ounces of balance. It's something that you have to cultivate and you have to create and you have to utilize certain practices in order to find that, that balance, if you will. So putting this all into context, I wanna give you all a little bit of a demonstration referred to as three months, three weeks, three days, three minutes, and 30 seconds. Now more than ever, it's been interesting due to the climate currently. And as a kinesiologist, I'm asked about what do I do as far as my exercise regimen or training routine is concerned because of the limitations we have on facilities and being able to travel? The next question that usually kind of comes up is something along the lines of diet or nutrition. And then eventually we get into maybe a little bit of hydration and down the line, we talk a little bit about sleep. And while we understand the value and importance of movement, sedentary behavior happens all the time. Most of us on this summit right now are in a sedentary state, we're sitting. So it's quite interesting that people approach me as a kinesiologist and ask, what should my exercise regimen be? When in actuality, you can spend three months being sedentary. You probably won't feel too great and your low back will probably be a little stiff, but you'll make it out of that once you start to incorporate movement in your life. And as we move down in this contextual format, we get into three weeks and the idea of nutrition comes into play. Well, what should I be eating and what's the best diet and how do I go about shopping in the grocery store? Now, this is not a homework assignment and I don't recommend anyone try this, if you will, 
but you can survive three weeks without food. That's been pretty well documented across history. Of course, you'll be in full starvation. You'll need to seek medical attention, but you will make it out of that situation. As we move down this figure, we get into three days and we're referring to dehydration. Our bodies can survive three days without water, not very long, and you'll probably need to seek medical attention for that as well with a saline intravenous IV, but again, you'll survive. But in as little as three minutes without your next inhale, you're gonna be in trouble. So just as a quick demonstration right now, wherever you are, whether you're sitting, standing, or, or lying flat, try to exhale everything out of your lung. Just completely void your lung of any type of air you have. And don't take another inhale. We're just gonna pause for 30 seconds. We're five seconds in. Rolling around on 10 seconds or so. About to cross the halfway mark. Here comes 20 plus and you start to get the point. It becomes very challenging for us, especially depending on how we're seated in our position. So putting this into context is to give you the idea that rarely do we consider the significance of optimal respiration. And this is where it all starts as far as performance and health optimization is concerned. Created what's called the pillars of health. And the first pillar of health is respiration. Respiration not only facilitates present moment awareness immediately, it's also effective. It's highly accessible. You don't have to download an app. You don't have to have a personal trainer. It's right there and it's free. It doesn't cost you anything. So right now, wherever you are, try to find that good posture position again, like we started in the beginning. And you can eat, cl close your eyes or keep them open, whichever is more comfortable for you. And just take a nice slow inhale through the nose, expanding that diaphragm, filling up the lungs. And as you pause at the top, soak in that inhale and slowly release all the way back down to the bottom. And just try that about two or three more times in through the nose, pausing at the top, exhaling nice and slowly. So you start to see how quickly it brings your attention into the present moment. Deep purposeful breathings in regard to the inhalation, the exhalation, these respiration cycles have some of the following benefits. And this is not an exhaustive list by any stretch of the imagination. We see that it reoxygenates our blood. It reallocates our blood as well, pulls our blood from lower extremities into where it needs it into the central nervous system, the brain specifically. We also see that it helps with the detoxification of our cellular activity, which to note, there are trillions of cells in our body. Ultimately here, the focus is present moment awareness. We have an opportunity approximately 23,000 times a day. That's a lot of opportunities to reset our central nervous system. So anytime our central nervous system gets out of balance and goes more into the sympathetic mode, we wanna bring it back to parasympathetic mode, that rest and digest, that relaxed, calm state. So as we take that deep inhale, what we do is we stimulate the vagus nerve, which is one of the longest nerves in our bodies. And this stimulation promotes parasympathetic mode activation, which helps with our cognitive clarity, our calmness, our centeredness. And that's the idea and the purpose centered around the sit, being able to take those deep breaths, being able to stay in the moment. And while our mind may wander, we always have the chance to bring it back. So my question for you, we've had about 19 and a half minutes or so, and ask yourself, how many deep breaths have you taken throughout this particular presentation? So in addition to respiration, the fundamental pillar, if you will, of performance and health optimization, we also have other pillars that through my, my courses, seminars, workshops, and virtual instruction sessions, I take the time to unpack in order to provide that in-depth overview of health and well-being as it directly relates to performance. So of course, hydration is next, get into nutrition, movement, and recovery. But for the sake of time, I just want you all to understand that all of these pillars are interdependent. And the importance of synthesis here in order to cultivate our balance and achieve our flow 
is to understand that we are the ultimate observer of our own mind-body connection. No one else can do that for us. And to reiterate, mindfulness is that foundational component of achieving and cultivating balance. So thank you all for your attention. I will definitely be around Q&A and looking forward to the next presenter. Thank you for that. That was fabulous as always and such a great way to actually start the, uh, the summit this morning. Um, I think we hear a lot about health and wellness and sort of as buzzword, but I really like your approach, um, giving us some scientific context and, and explaining to us, you know, what those words mean and, and how you can implement them for uh, performance. Um, the whole, yeah, the whole goal of this session is, is really to, to talk about um, and think about how we can influence um, uh, coaching, athletes, performance, and think about sport in a, in a different way with different approaches, um, more, more holistic, more global. And I think that what you presented uh, definitely um, 